Welcome to The Reckoning. The Reckoning is the digital publication by CNP focused on thought-provoking news and unique stories about the Black LGBTQIA plus community. You can read The Reckoning at thereckoningmag.org. We are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom by honoring its deputy director and chief organizer, Bayard Rustin. Joining me is journalist Joseph Williams. Williams serves as the race and health editor for The Reckoning, and he wrote the article Reconsidering Rustin, his trailblazing legacy 60 years after the March on Washington. Hey there, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us to have this important conversation about Rustin. And um, one of the things that's really interesting for me is I grew up uh, in Chester, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. which is about 20 miles from Westchester, Pennsylvania. And I grew up knowing nothing about Rustin. We talked about the March on Washington. We talked about um, Dr. Martin Luther King, but I didn't learn about Rustin until I actually got to college. Um, so it was, it was, a, I remember it being a revelation for me, uh, learning this history and that he grew up so close to me. So I'm curious for you, um, when did you first learn about Bayard Rustin? Um, and what did you think when you first began to hear this history? Well, I was kind of like you. I mean, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, of all places. So civil rights history was not a thing in my high school. Uh, and I didn't really learn about Brother Rustin until I must have been in my 20s, give or take. And I was in Richmond, Virginia. And I have a friend who was really into black history. He kind of hit me to that um, and told me a little bit about uh, Brother Rustin. But even then, it was fairly truncated. You know, we're just talking about, you know, his role in the March on Washington. We're talking about, you know, how he was, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a key ally of Martin Luther King. But we didn't learn any of the stuff that I learned in reporting this story. And even then, I learned uh, in reporting the story some things I didn't even know up to that point. So it was really striking and very impressive to, to hear the kind of career that uh, Rustin had and the things that he had done even before he got to King and the March on Washington. Wow. So let's dive into the piece a little bit. So uh, you, of course, wrote this piece for The Reckoning called Reconsidering Rustin, his trailblazing legacy 60 years after the March on Washington. And there's a quote I want to pull out uh, to jump us into this conversation. It's from Dr. Lerone Martin, Lerone A. Martin. Mm -hmm. And the quote is, his turn from protest to politics, his embrace of certain aspects of political conservatism, coupled with King's martyrdom, overshadowed his previous radicalism, causing some to forget, remove him from the legacy of the civil rights movement. Um, I want to start there because I agree. And I'm curious... When you when you were reporting on Rustin, what were some of the things from your perspective that you're like, ah, here are the key reasons why this legacy has been removed? Right. Well, there are many things. And first and foremost was his uh, sexuality. I mean, that was really huge in, in leading him to be kind of overshadowed even in time. Right. Because at the time in the late 50s and the early 1960s, if you were a gay man, you were living a closeted life. You you were you didn't even want to come close to being out in public. But if you're a gay black man, that's a double bind because certainly the, the, the larger culture was not only hostile to your race, but also hostile to your sexual orientation. And that led a lot of people to, to kind of push Rustin to the side for fear of discrediting the movement, for fear of opening uh, King and others up to blackmail, which several people kind of did try. Uh, and for having historians kind of overlook uh, a lot of his contributions and where he came from and what he was about. Now, further on in his career, Rustin kind of embraced a, a capitalist model. Um, he was a union advocate for a long, long time, grew up under the tutelage of A. Phil Randolph, who was legendary. And Randolph himself, a lot of people don't know all that much about, um, about him. So you have two kind of figures that are in the shadow of King and other major protest leaders. But his embrace of capitalism uh, and that economic equality was really the argument which kind of was dovetailing with what King was asking for at the National Mall, but he fully embraced it. He basically said that the black man was not going to be anywhere close to equality unless he had economic parity with whites. 
and that could only be accomplished through union activization. But um, a lot of people are, are, are not really familiar with the fact that unions in the 50s and 60s, and even currently today, really have a bad race problem. Um, that a lot of the leadership on unions is white, um, and particularly in trade unions like labor unions, police unions, uh, construction workers, miners, those kinds of unions, they have a, a tenuous relationship with, with, with African Americans, with black people. And so there's a lot of kind of a racial dynamic that Rustin was kind of looking past in the, the opinions of others. People thought that Rustin was kind of ignoring uh, civil rights in favor of labor and in favor of you know wages and, and so on and so forth. And that kind of is, is, is an ancillary footnote to what King was trying to do, even though the weekend that King died, he was there in support of a strike of the Memphis Garbage Workers Union. So mm. it all kind of becomes entangled. But Rustin, in addition to his labor acti activism, was also in favor of the India struggle against Great Britain um, and some other world conflicts that his pacifist uh, uh, core principles kind of overshadowed the work that he did for the civil rights movement. So his embrace of capitalism, his pro-union activities, his um, embrace of freedom struggles around the world and not just the United States, plus coupled with the fact that he was an out game man in a time where that was not a thing, led people to kind of overshadow um, his legacy and kind of discount his larger contributions to the movement. Wow. Um, this is so important because when we think of we often put black men in this box and we expect black men, we expect folks like Rustin to stay in a civil rights box. Mm -hmm. This is your fight. This is your struggle. This is what you do. Uh, and we're not going to talk about that gay thing, right? <laughs> in addition. And what we, I think we're seeing and what I was reading from your piece as well is seeing Rustin as a fully formed human being who knew who he was and was also incredibly strategic and understood kind of the intersecting issues impacting all people and were and was approaching life in that way. And I think that is really rare. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you put your finger right on it and you took the words out of my mouth. But I was going to say, yeah, he was at the intersection of a lot of things and he was intersectionality before that even was a word or a concept. And he saw himself more as a global citizen and a person who was in, involved in the global fight for human rights not just the rights of black people. And that led a lot of conflict and a lot of tension within the movement, even at the time, as James Farmer was quoted in Byard By Rustin's obituary in the New York Times, talking about how he had some concerns about the fact that Rustin didn't know which side he was fighting on. And that, in a nutshell, kind of encapsulates why his history has been so overshadowed and why we have a hard time uh, re-embracing what he was about. I mean, he was a man ahead of his time, and now we have the language, we have perspective, we have the words to talk about intersectionality and to talk about where all sides of him kind of came to be a complete and whole person and was a universal activist for, for human rights, as opposed to just being in that box that you talked about, where he was a black man, therefore you had to restrict yourself to the black struggle, and that's all you could do. Hmm. Uh John D. Emilio talks uh, a bit about Rustin not pretending to be someone else, right? Being who he was. Um, from your perspective, can you talk about, in this time, why it's important to recognize the power in doing that at the time that Rustin was alive and doing his most important work for the Black liberation struggle and the civil rights movement? We talk a lot um, these days about authenticity, how you want to live your authentic self, how you want to be your whole self and bring your whole self to whatever um, endeavor you're, you're, you're striving to, to, to do. He was very much about that. And he learned those lessons at an early age. His grandparents were Quakers. He was the, the young son of a single mom. She and her parents helped raise Baird um, to be authentic and to not suffer fear and to not be afraid of, 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 going out into the world and being yourself. And this is in the 1920s and 30s when the, the word gay didn't exist, you know, and people didn't even want to talk about discussions of sexuality. So it came to him, he was a unique and singular individual, but he got a lot of support at an early age and that kind of embodied him with a sense of fearlessness. Uh, the fearlessness that he was able to, to in the 1940s, uh, defy segregation in a bus 
uh, in, in public transportation and get sentenced to a chain gang for it, um, to defy being swept up in the fervor of World War II, which, as we all know, you know, the greatest generation. And he was like, no, I want no part of that because I'm a pacifist. So certainly his dedication to being his authentic self and to not pretend who he was, um, not pretend some, to be something that he wasn't, very much drove him and very much drove his fight. So I think he, there's a lot of admiration to be had in the fact that now we're talking about um, being authentic and he was doing it 40, 50, 60 years ago when it really wasn't a thing and we didn't have the language to describe the fact that being authentic is is the way to to health health happiness and being whole. Now, now that being said, he did have his challenges. Um, you know, his uh, refusal to go along um, with the norms of the day led him to 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 be, see the inside of a jail cell more than once. Um, it led him to be marginalized by the movement. It led him to you know probably no end of not being able to get work or being ha- you know having people whisper about him. But he was beyond that. And so we, we talk about evolution and being evolved and sensing that you are who you are and that you reach that higher plane. A lot of people, uh, historians, DeLillo, you know, De Emilio among them, would say that Rustin was on that higher plane before even people could even conceptualize it. Wow. What, uh, as my final question for you, what um, did you personally take away um, after writing this story about Rustin? And what do you hope that all of us can take away after reading your story about his legacy? I think my main takeaway was that he was a really complex, brilliant, and again, a singular individual, you know, who was a lot stronger and a lot smarter than we probably even give him credit for. Um, He was on par with King in terms of of strategic uh, capability and in terms of objective. I think he was getting lost in the midst of history, but now he's being rediscovered. And I think that we need to, to identify him as a man ahead of his time. You know, we have unique individuals throughout history, and he is one of them, people who who are fearless, people who have ideas, imagination, drive, and the will to carry those things out. I think that he is is somebody who needs to be elevated to the the, the Mount Olympus of civil rights activists, um, even though he had a complex legacy. I mean, let's let's face it. There were times where he was in conflict with the movement, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it is that conflict that drove it forward. It is that conflict where ideas come, come to fore. And I think that he is finally getting the recognition that he deserves. Awesome. Joseph Williams, thank you so much for unpacking this uh, piece that you wrote for The Reckoning. Um, It is incredibly impactful and uh, we are excited to celebrate Rustin's legacy uh, on the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. My pleasure. Thank you.